A royal palace temple in downtown Bangkok, Thailand, charges local residents about $1 to enter. However, the foreign tourists who come by and the gatekeepers figure who they are any way they can, well, they have to pay something like $10. A Thailand missionary family friend of mine made a visit back there and the younger brother, Don, protested vigorously to the guard using the only three or four Thai words he could recall. I was born here, he remonstrated. So look, aren't I like a Thai citizen? I should get in for $1. The ticket sellers saw all that blonde hair and light colored skin and remained unconvinced. Even a Bangkok birth certificate probably wasn't going to do the trick. Finally, Don pulled a $10 bill out of his wallet and handed it over. But as he went inside, Don had a final parting shot for the men. Boys, when you guys come over to the States to visit Disneyland, I hope they charge the two of you $100 each. <laughs> we don't like a double standard, do we? Down at the Magic Kingdom, it just doesn't fly to charge blonde tourists three times the going rate. And for one privileged person to operate by a different set of rules at work, a personalized schedule. Hmm, that destroys morale. Well, that's why it's a bit astonishing here in 1 Corinthians 5, when Paul seems to give us exactly that, a double standard. Ironically, the insiders, the club members, pay the highest admission charges. Expel the wicked man from among you, he writes in the final sentence of 1 Corinthians 5, verse 13. Well, that's harsh, you may be saying. And maybe we're not living up to all of that, at least at my church we're not. But where's the double standard? Return to verses 9 and 10. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. A clear word paraphrases and puts that last line colorfully. You'd better live on another planet. What's going on here? Paul is flatantly teaching a double standard. Within the church, we're not supposed to tolerate open, blatant sin. We must not permit it or associate with such people or even have a social meal with them. Instead, we must cut them off, expel them, cast them out of fellowship, hand this man over to Satan, it says in verse 5, which we'll discuss a bit later. But as soon as we step outside the church, Sabbath or Sunday morning at noon, and go out into the world filled with people committing the very same sins, the rule changes. We can mingle with these people, having lunch at the mall with the world's sinners and appreciating, associating with secular gossips and pagan swindlers. One of the Pharisees' greatest complaints about Jesus was that he often dined with sinners. Your master eats with tax collectors and sinners, they scolded the disciples. Well, Jesus defended himself in Mark 2.17 by saying, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Does it seem ironic, then, that we find two ticket prices posted? Out in the world, we can befriend all of the wicked people we meet. In fact, the Bible commands us to do that following the example of Jesus. But inside the church, if we encounter people in the pews doing the very same sins, we're supposed to take them off our social register, don't even have lunch with such a person. Why the double standard? Well, I think a couple of stories will help us understand. For 10 or 15 years, I used to play racquetball intentionally with a bunch of non-church guys who cussed and swore, non-believers, most of them. Why? Witnessing opportunities. Of course, I love to play racquetball, but it worked. 
Their language and swear words basically ceased after a while. They respected me for not swearing. And some, true story, became believers. In their book, Becoming a Contagious Christian, Bill Hybels and Mark Middleburg talk about some of the witnessing opportunities that come along for the truly contagious believer. Hybels, a sailing enthusiast, would often go with a crew of eight guys, none of them Christians, for sailboat races. After each race, back at the regatta while waiting for the race results, he confessed that one activity pretty much ruled the consumption of massive quantities of alcohol. As Hybels found himself with eight sunburned, inebriated guys whose vocabularies and fish stories came close to matching the saltiness of the ocean, he asked himself, what am I doing here? The Holy Spirit whispered back, you're building bridges, you're establishing trust, you're laying the foundation for conversations that might happen a year from now. Above all, you're doing the kind of thing that Jesus did. A bit later, he described the growing relationship that he has with a rough and gruff restaurant owner who once told him what he thought real living was. A day on my powerboat with a case of beer, a carton of camels, and my gal in a bikini. Well, Hybels responded with a grin, Man, you don't know what real living is. Real living is a sailboat and a steady wind, the sun at your back, and a few close buddies you can open up your life to about things that really matter. Can you see the friendship seeds beginning to sprout as a born-again Christian like Bill Hybels sails and eats and even drinks sodas with the boozing, sinning sailors of the world? Well, back to the other side of the coin, though. Why can't we mingle with fellow Christians who are getting drunk on their sailboats? Why the difference? I recall a TV film, Just Between Friends, from a number of years ago that makes an interesting point. A man, having an affair and cheating on his wife, requested his best friend to help cover for him. Harry, the friend, was close with both the man and his spouse, so in essence, he was being asked to help deceive someone he cared about. The cheating husband asked his friend to lie for him, to concoct excuses and to corroborate flimsy alibis. In other words, he wanted his friend to enable him to continue with his sin while staying in the marriage. Well, finally, Harry said, look, pal, I can't do this. I can't help you treat Holly this way. Count me out. Maybe right there we can see the perfect wisdom of the Bible revealed in this so-called double standard. A Christian pastor, or any of us really, might well sit down to lunch at Denny's with a confused, searching person from out there, a non-believer. The guy's cheating on his wife, or he's a rip-off artist, a gossiping liar, a messed up, selfish, greedy, immoral person. But you dialogue with him sharing your own faith. As you do so, you build the first strands of a bridge of friendship. At the same time, you trust in God to create some progress. Even Paul himself, in his letter to the Colossians in chapter 4, verse 5, wrote, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. But now let's say you are having lunch with a fellow church member. The person claims to be a Christian and sits next to you in the choir. Now he or she whispers to you, I'm in trouble. Help me out here. I think my wife suspects. Can you tell him or you, can you tell her that I was with you last Thursday? Tell him or her I, I was at the board meeting and it went till 11.30. Now, such a person wants your aid to keep on sinning. What's more, the individual seeks to stay in the good graces of the church and even the good graces of God while deliberately and knowingly breaking his law. He or she is trying to use you and the church 
to continue in a path destructive to that very church. Can you see here the wisdom of God? God's word says a clear no to that kind of self-destruction. Paul protects the church, safeguarding its reputation. Beyond that, it prevents a wayward, bent-on-evil sinner from the danger of self-delusion, of getting to remain in a cozy church pew, enjoying the acceptance of Christian fellowship while a spiritual cancer spreads within. Now, having said that, we want to point out that sorrow and love are still the twin hallmarks of the Christian church's moments of discipline. Sorrow, love. Yes, it may have to send a sinner out into the darkness, but to paraphrase a radio commercial popular a few years ago, someone still leaves the light on for you. 